Hello everyone, welcome to our open news meeting. Uh, my name is James Harding, I'm the co-founder of Tortoise. I see that my fellow co-founder Katie Bannock smith is here. Welcome everyone. Um, welcome to our new office. Behind me you can see uh, people unpacking boxes. Uh, we've moved around the corner in London and uh, we are unpacking, getting ready to move into our office. And so one of the questions on our mind this week uh, is not just journalistic, it's practical. Uh, it's about the extent to which the rising infection numbers suggest we should have a rethink on lockdown. But before I get into that, I just want to talk about this Tuesday thinking and the open news thinking and the, the work we're trying to do on making it more effective as a forum for us to test ideas and then to practically and materially inform our journalism. And when I say materially inform it, the reason is this. I, I remember when I was at the FT, we worked with a, I worked with a reporter, let's call him Ray, because his, his name was Ray, uh, and people um, used to say about him that he was an unbelievable gatherer of information, one of those real magpie reporters, but you in effect had to hold him up by his ankles and uh, shake him and see what fell out of his, fell out of his pockets um, to see what stories he had. Wouldn't necessarily be able to marshal what he'd heard into a story. And one of the things that Liz Mosley and I, Liz, many of you on the call will know, not least because many of your colleagues taught us, but many members will know as our members editor and, uh, and, the, and the mastermind of our thinkings. Liz has been, Liz and I have been talking about this particular thinking, the Tuesday open news thinking. And it's really important to us because if you like, it's the essence of an open newsroom at work, but it's felt problematic because rather like Ray, it feels as though we're gathering lots of pieces of information, but they're not quite making it through into our journalism. And so what we're going to try this week, and if it goes well in the coming weeks, is seeing whether we can go back to the original idea of tortoise, which was that we would take subjects and interrogate them in our open news format, in our thinking, and then as a result of that, come to a better informed point of view. And if you've been around the tortoise story for a while, you'll know that we originally started out with this idea that the thinking was like a Times leader meeting. I used to work at the Times, and when we held Times leader meeting, people would come in, they'd argue different sides of a particular issue, and at the end of it, you'd come out with an informed point of view. We want that informed point of view to be informed by everyone in the Tortoise team, but everyone who's members of Tortoise too. And so we're gonna try this week to hold, if you like, an editorial conference. Now, when I was at the Times, the, the team would come in at about midday, and I would typically say, what have we got, right? And they would then run through a list of subjects. They might say, okay, we're going to decide to try and do something on the Californian wildfires. We think we should do something on Macron's uh, economic plan. We'd like to do something on Rule Britannia at the proms. And you get a sort of menu and then you choose two or three. Well, in order to make sure that people can take part, think ahead of time uh, on the subject, we've, we've put out this morning three subjects that we think we'd like to talk about today. And we're going to take a little time on each. So one is, is it time to return to lockdown? This is a UK focused question, but is it time in the UK to return to lockdown? The second is, is Extinction Rebellion right to disrupt the presses? And um, the third is, is state aid worth the fight? As in, is it right to go, come to a no deal if we can't get the terms we want on state aid provision in the UK? We're going to do each one in turn. I suspect the lockdown is going to be the meatiest and most difficult. And I've invited a couple of colleagues from the start just to, if you like, sketch out what we think the arguments are on both sides. But critical to this is that we hear from everyone, uh, as many people as possible, tortoise colleagues, tortoise members, please do weigh in. You'll see that um, my colleague Claudia Williams uh, is here on the chat. She's uh, framed the questions. She'll also prompt you uh, to join us in the debate. But why don't we uh, start? I think 
Liz, you and Basher, I think, are on either sides of the argument to begin with. Do you, do you want to... Basher, are you there? It's me and Merope. Oh, me and Merope, forgive me. Merope, why don't you start with... Because I have to say I'm slightly spooked by the numbers. So what's the argument for saying let's return to some form of lockdown now? OK, I'm going to... Hello, everyone. Um, here I am in an unflattering light to make the case for returning to uh, lockdown, the unpopular case, uh, but maybe the necessary case. Um, so I'm going to start with uh, some stats, which is to say, yesterday, the UK recorded 3,000 cases of COVID for the second day running. That is a 50% rise on the week before, and Sunday itself was a 65% rise in a single day, and the highest uh, daily rise since May. Uh, a lot of people probably know that local lockdowns were in poorer areas, but now COVID is spreading to more affluent areas, especially among um, affluent young people between 17 and 21 years old, uh, uh, where the high uh, infections are happening and those people obviously have a low risk of dying but they have serious symptoms and a serious uh, chance of passing it on. Uh, it's worth saying that this isn't down to more um, testing uh, because test positivity, the proportion of tests uh, which show someone is, um, has got COVID is going up. So the proportion, not just the number of tests. Um, but it's also worth saying that testing is a huge mess at the moment, as it often is. Uh, you can't get a home test. Uh, test sites look like they have capacity. If you drive past the test site, it looks uh, free and available. But the issue is in the labs, which are completely overrun with tests at the moment. This morning, the head of NHS testing had to apologise for the fact that people just cannot get a test at the moment or are being sent miles and miles, you know, from London to Scotland or whatever um, to try and get a test and obviously we don't have an effective test uh, track and trace system so you've got cases going up uh, and that's when schools are only just this week back uh, universities not yet back and offices being encouraged to go back soon as you said at the start uh, James taught us going back soon and now in this climate everyone say well that's fine many people say there's hospitalizations the low deaths are still low. There were two deaths only on uh, the 6th of September, and that's pretty standard at the moment. But it's worth pointing out that on the 30th of July, uh, Spain uh, had started its new spike, the sort of beginning of this um, spike. They had 2,700 cases and, uh, and only two deaths a day. So basically, they were then where we are now. And uh, now uh, they are 10,000 cases a day and uh, 50 deaths a day on average, 237 in the last week. Uh, so my argument would be, let's not make the same mistake as last time. Let's see what's happening in Europe. Let's act more decisively. We are six weeks behind France now. We're tracking France who are themselves tracking uh, Spain by a few weeks. And if you look at their graphs, they are going like that. Uh, the only way to stop it is to act decisively. Uh, and Merope, yeah. a, a couple of things. So the, the Spanish deaths number yes. is still way lower, right, than it was in March, April, i.e. the proportion of deaths and the hospitalisation numbers are still much, much lower. That is true, but they are on a, they are on a, if you look at their sort of graph, it went like that and is now sort of there. So they are, it's not flattening yet. It's still right. very much on the return. And again, it's around young people just as schools have gone back. And, and is it and is the is the idea that so so one of the things that someone was saying to me last week was actually we had we and other countries had very high mortality rates as a proportion of infection and hospitalizations, partly because some of the things that hospitals themselves were doing were wrong, incubation, etc. Is the expectation that the death rates, because 50 deaths in Spain, let's face it, is still not a large number, mm -hmm. is the expectation that the lag is going to be longer this time because it's younger people who then need to infect older, more vulnerable people, or is it that hospitalisation and treatments have become more effective and so we think it's going to be a lower proportion overall? I think, I think treatment is getting better around the world and across the world, and that's clearly what we've seen here. Um, but equally, I think that um, I read something that said that because people are wearing masks more and socially distancing more, people are... There are, you are being exposed to a lower dosage when you get it. And that might be one of the reasons. Um, but um, 
I, I mean, my, my whole argument for being pro lockdown would be, um, which I am up to a point. I mean, obviously, I would hate to have my, my children back in the house at this point. I really <laughs> just got rid of them. Um, <laughs> but but the, 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 um, the government messaging is so confused right now. You could ask anyone on this thinking, how many people from other households are you allowed to socialise with outside? Or is that, nobody knows. Maybe I had to look it up this morning in case you, in case you asked me what the answer to that was. Because nobody... Is the what is okay. the Anyone know? Anyone know? It's Katie Vanek Smith there with a six. It's not six household outside your own home. You know, can you stay in someone's house? It, there's a whole thing about you can interact socially with one household somewhere, but if you see someone you know at a restaurant or a church, you can't say hello. It's all so confusing um, that I think that that is part of the problem of where we are right now. And there's a sort of Pollyanna-ish desire to just open everything up, let's open offices, everyone get back to work, save Pret. At the same time as doing schools, at the same time as doing universities, it seems mad. Yeah, okay. I'm not sure that that many people seem like going, save Pret. But yes, I see, <laughs> I see the point. Liz. We can't hear you. I think, I think high, uh, of higher powers yeah. silence Liz Mosley. Oh, no. They have, oh, I know. Are. <laughs> how quickly they forget. Um, <laughs> so I'm here to make the case against, um, and I started uh, my sort of research on this really with all of the um, well known now numbers about the extreme negative effects socially and economically of a full lockdown has been absolutely brutal. I looked at, you know, all, all the stuff we know about domestic abuse, about unemployment, about deepening inequality and all those things that we know about how um, a, a national lockdown is completely and utterly brutal. But really, I sort of felt that was the wrong framing of the argument against, because the truth is, and Michael Kowalski has made this uh, comment in the chat, that um, there is no such thing still really as following the science. There's so much we still don't know. There's no prospect of a vaccine anytime soon. So I think we have to um, find a way to live with the virus without switching everything off and sending everybody home. I think that's the, that's the, the sort of the start point, really. We must adapt. And almost to go into lockdown is letting ourselves and the government off the hook for finding a way to establish the processes that they should have established over the summer to do with testing, to do with track and trace, to do with all the things that were laid out um, and haven't materialised. Um, and then I think the other really compelling argument against is that although it is surprising how hard it is to come by accurate numbers, but it would seem that local lockdowns, because of course the cases are so very varied, Cornwall at three and 100,000 people, and Bolton at 115 and 100,000 people, and Leeds, a lot of people are talking about at the moment, my family are in Leeds, so obviously I'm interested in it, has gone from 27 and a half um, last week to 41.6 per 100,000 this week. Um, it would seem that um, there is some suggestion that local lockdown can work. You know, Burnley was one of the first areas to have a local lockdown restriction and it halved its cases before and after from 52 to 25. So if we can get to the stage where we're able to do more targeted control, that would seem to be more appropriate than just wiping everybody out. The other thing that I think is there's two other things that I think are worth saying. I think that perhaps... Um, Argue, arguments against. Firstly, um, in relation to students going back, my niece is about to start her first term at Manchester Metropolitan University and there is nothing like the news story that a student um, house in Leeds that held a party, the, the person who was the, deemed the organiser of that party was fined £10,000 for breaking the rules of the lockdown. There's nothing like other and more compelling forms of stick to help control perhaps younger people who are being rather relaxed and lay say fair about lockdown restrictions and I wonder if there's not been enough of that quite yet and then the second thing is I know the question is should we go into lockdown rather than will we but my feeling is that perhaps if we were to have to go down into another national lockdown it would there'd be no way for the government to escape a tacit admission that they've you know royally asked up this whole thing because if we have to, that is like them saying, you're right, we didn't manage it, There's, you know, we, we, we've let everybody down, and I just don't feel like this government would do that. 
Okay, well, I'm going to, on the, on the subject of royally asking things up, I'm more <laughs> Tess Murray's WhatsApp group, so it's just worth hearing <laughs> Tess's experience of testing. Testing, I'm right, yeah. With this. Tess, are you there? Hi. You were on my WhatsApp group. No, it was I called us WhatsApp group. No, I don't know which exactly. one. Okay, <clears throat> so I've been feeling a bit rough the last couple of days, and, um, and I thought, well, let's, you know, let's go and get this checked out. So I went online this morning, I'm in W6, you know, I'm right in London. Went onto the NHS site this morning, no tests available, try again this evening. And the nearest testing centre they were offering was Romford, which is an hour and 15 minutes away, driving. And still no guarantee that if I went on tonight that I would be able to get a test there tomorrow. So I, and no Katie Bannock Smith in the private chat, it is not too much partying, thanks for the sympathy. <laughs> um, anyway, um, so I just booked into a private testing centre near me and spunked, you know, 135 quid on it because I've got, my girls have just gone back to school. Um, I'm due to see my parents at the weekend and I thought, well, I can't, I have to know whether this is just a bit of a cold or something else going on. And then it just struck me. What if I, you know, what if I didn't have the resources either to drive or to get to a testing centre or to, put, or to, you know, have the luxury of being able to pay for a private test where I get the results back this evening? Um, what would I do? Would I send, carry on sending the girls into school while I'm feeling a bit ill? Would I keep them off for a week? You know, and, and the pra practicalities of this just suddenly really hit me. And also the sense of sort of personal responsibility that comes into it which is, we're lucky we're working from home. What if I had to go into work tomorrow? Would I, would I just chance it? Would I carry on? Because if I didn't have a choice about working from home? And that's the sort of, the reality of working, you know, getting back to normal while we have such a car crash on testing. Yeah. Um, it, it just strikes me that we're, you know, we're shouting into the wind on this because unless we, we can have fast, reliable, free testing, we're not going to be able to, get back to normal, get life back on the road, get the economy back and running businesses back in schools, you know, da, 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 da. And we, you know, I feel like we've been saying the same flipping thing since March in the newsroom, which is testing sits at the heart of this. And we have yet to come up with a testing system that's efficient or accessible or free. And Tess, just out of interest, if you, if you test, because you don't know the results of your test now, right? If you, if the result of the test is positive this evening, Right. Would your conclusion from that be, look, this thing is much more widely uh, spread than we think. And actually, we're not in a position to start taking our kids back to school and reopening. If it's negative, would you think differently? I, how do you think your views will change, given what you hear later? I don't, I'm not sure how much it'll change on a macro scale, because I've sort of been, you know, as you know, I've been holed up in the country all summer. So I've come back to London. Um, I think it's more on the micro scale about what that means for the children of being off school. And um, I mean, it, <clears throat> I don't know. I mean, I'm pretty careful. I sanitize, I wear masks, I observe, you know, stuff, but it would certainly make me feel like this, this is just rumbling on and it's still there. And we're a bit naive to imagine that infection rates aren't going to go back up when people start coming out of lockdown. Okay. Tess, I'm going to, Thank you. I, I'm going to I'm going to ask Giles in a moment just about testing and tracing and what's happened here. Um, Liz, firstly, just one thing. The, the thing that I'm not sure about the argument, the, the argument, if we were to make the argument that says, look, we, we're going to need to figure out a way of living with COVID for all of the economic and social reasons you said, actually, it's much too blunt an instrument lockdown, given that. The, the, the problem I've got with that argument is two things. One is, it's fine to say we could do this, we could be much better targeted if we had a test and trace system that was working. While it's not, that's much harder. And you'll see the second point, which is, look, if we can impose fines, then there are other means of enforcing social distancing. My only problem is, if you're a student, you get imposed to get a fine of 10,000 pounds, you might as well get a fine of 50 million pounds. I mean, who's, who, who can possibly handle a fine like that. So even that doesn't feel like it's a very effective way of enforcing this. So I, I guess what I'm saying is I still don't see what the system is that provides sufficient confidence for going back within the sort of current circumstances we've got, un unless we're basically making a herd immunity argument and that's something different. Yeah, I don't, I don't know we're making a herd immunity argument, um, although 
there are those who suggest that the reason why infection rates in London aren't rising as quickly is because so many people here had it earlier on. I, I don't know the truth, the truth of that. I suppose my point about the fines is that um, I don't buy the um, argument that Matt Hancock was making, which is oh, I'm appealing to your compassionate and empathetic selves by not infecting your gram to encourage young people to not go and party and do Freshers' Week and everything else. I think that there, there is a harder disincentive, and whether it's £10,000 or £1,000, I don't know, that, will fo that would focus the minds of those young people going back, as Harika says in the chat, into student areas, Hyde Park in Leeds and Headingley, where there's a bunch of really vulnerable people who are the local residents of those areas of the towns, because that's what the students tend to be, mm. um, to, to kind of get those guys to really but, you know, focus your mind and stay in your house. Mm. Um, and, and I don't know that we've explored that right. I, I, sufficiently at this stage. But Matt, Dan, Matt, Dan Kona, you that I know we've had this debate for six months. Are we, are we, do you think, or is the government, do you think, pushing us into an argument that is essentially herd immunity? Not, not, by, not deliberately, um, but by stages and, and uh, by accident. I mean, we've moved, I mean, this government has moved from being a government that was defined by it's uh, kind of an insurgent uh, slogan, take back control to don't kill your granny. And that kind of, for me, that, that, <laughs> that describes the, the, the arc of its descent. Um, I don't think you can go back to full lockdown for uh, just a whole series of reasons, economic, social, psychiatric. Um, you know, as it is, we're defibrillating the economy. And I think if we went back into full lockdown, we'd be looking at rigor mortis um, and, 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 you know, civil unrest. Is it herd immunity what we have? Well, not, not, not officially, whereas before lockdown, there was, at least behind the scenes, official um, kind of embrace of herd immunity. What, what you're getting is certain groups of the population now increasingly set free and, and about to or already congregating in school and universities, doing exactly what you do when you want the maximum people to um, infect one another and those younger populations tend not to suffer grievous consequences. We know that 70% of people who get it in total are asymptomatic. So the big question then to sort of answer the how do we handle it in terms of nuance is how do we shield those who need to be shielded because I think the, the problem here is twofold is that as has been said by several people already the testing regime is an international scandal. I mean, if, if you look back at all the various areas that have been made so far, the ditching of a serious test contact trace regime early in the process, I think was the kind of original sin of the whole thing. It was an amazing uh, wrong turn, um, and one for which we're still paying. And, this, and, and the final thing, I think, which is, a, rich irony is that you know this is a government that prides itself and has often succeeded by simplicity of message you know it won the election with get brexit done it managed initial lockdown with stay at home its messaging since the relaxation of lockdown in june has just been um, vanishingly negligible and completely confusing so that's what alarms me is I don't think we can go back into lockdown, but I think we need much greater clarity um, and, and none is forthcoming. And perhaps if there was, you know, senior members of the government were spending less time trying to rebuild NASA in the cabinet office, uh, you know, that might help. Um, I, I see Harry Moore, thank, Matt, thank you. I see, see Harry Moore's got his hand up. And I also wanted to come to Rene, uh, and I hope I pronounce your name right, Rene Blio, Lau. Um, because you were just saying that you've been for a test in Scotland and found it easier to get. Harry, Moy, what did you want to say? Hello. Um, I, I, I kind of echo um, uh, Matthew's point um, that really we, we can't go back into a full lockdown, um, but also um, the, the government's sort of been quite, um, quite poor with their communication. I think with the, with, with the full lockdown, I think that I think a post-mortem of the previous one in terms of its effectiveness is still yet to really be done. Um, so, for example, uh, one of the arguments that's being made is the fact that um, at the moment there's going to be there's going to be considerable lag because of the fact that uh, young people uh, appear to be the people of whom are um, uh, have currently got it. 
but we have to consider the fact that at the very beginning of the of, of coronavirus um it wasn't young people getting tested and the test capacity was capacity was really really low so we don't actually know if the young people if there was a lag to begin with with respect to young people there may very well have been yeah. um and and we're now we're now facing that now um mm -hmm. I think as well, um, we've seen that, um, I, I was reading an article that sort of suggested that perhaps um, during that sort of initial wave, uh, it was actually three times worse than we initially knew. Um, so therefore, we then ha we have to sort of look now and see how that compares um, to how what, what we're currently in now compares to back then. And I think it begins to look a bit smaller what, how we're facing now. Um, so. And, and then also the, with respect to the national debt, the national debt's also very, um, is already very high. Um, and I think that unless the government can be clever with, with, how, they, with how they use their money, mm -hmm. uh, I think that we're going, to end up in a, we're going to end up in a double dip recession most likely. Yeah, Harry, th Harry thank you. I'm, I'm just going to turn to a couple of my colleagues because Ollie Bothwell, a colleague of mine, is sort of, Makes life simple. Ollie, your basic view is let, let's let's lock down again now. Is that right? Hello. Hi, Ollie. Hi. My internet connection is being really dodgy today, so it might cut it out. So apologies for that. But yeah, I think um, lockdown is. Maybe I'm being a bit extreme in the chat, but I feel like if we're not going to test people and we're not going to um, track and trace, then we know what we're going to get ourselves into. Mm -hmm. So I'm quite worried that everyone goes back to work, everyone goes back to school, and suddenly the cases go up and up. And that's that. All right. All right. And Basha, can I, Ollie, thank you. I know I appreciate the point about the internet. Basha, so, so what would your argument be? You're worried about the, about getting yeah. it and moving with it. I mean, I'm worried about the fact that, you know, we've, we've really concentrated on deaths and deaths are only a part of the picture, which we have managed to bring down, obviously. But, you know, from, from a personal experience, um, you know, lots of you know, I've spoken about it. My dad got COVID early on in lockdown. He is still suffering months and months later. And I think that, you know, I'm not worried about catching the virus and dying from it. I think that's highly unlikely. But I am worried about catching it, having a mild or moderate case, and then having to live with the health consequences of that for, you know, we don't know how long afterwards. And I think that is forgotten in this argument about, you know, whether we should just, I was reading earlier, you know, that we're kind of, particularly young people are caught in this complete paradox where we're being told, eat out and, you know, start resuming your normal life, go back to the office, but at the same time, don't relax too much because you're contributing to a rise in infection rates. And I think that messaging forgets the fact that young people can still have very long, long-term health consequences if they catch COVID. And it also just encapsulates this like ridiculously confused messaging, which I think is just irresponsible. So you're, so, so, but then just follow that through because uh, there is no, so, so you would then argue what, that essentially Merrick's argument, let's not repeat the mistake of February, March. Yeah, I think, I mean, I agree with Liz to a point that I think, you know, it, it is the responsibility of our government and, and people in, in power to think about ways that we can learn to better live with this virus. That's clear. And I don't think that returning to a full lockdown is, is possible. But I also think that we're clearly nowhere near getting to a place where we're going to live with it in a in a responsible way and i think the idea of telling everyone to go back to the office to start using public transport again at the same time as sending people back kids back to school and people to university feels like everything all at once when we still don't have any of the infrastructure to really manage and and observe how these are going to affect infection rates so i th i think if i was going to advocate for anything i would suggest a very very slow rollout of all those things yeah. um, and and I would and I would you know I would probably extend furlough I would say give another couple of months mm -hmm. um, I would I would I don't I mean schools I don't know because I don't have kids so I you know I, I I'm probably uh, 
I've probably got a real <laughs> rose-tinted view of what that means to we're live. Gonna come up with a, we're going to come up with a sort of scheme that's sort of helpful to me in Merope, which is we shut down <laughs> yeah. the national economy, but we send our kids to school until it reopens. <laughs> and we'll pick them up yeah. afterwards. Um, <laughs> Merope, keep, keep school going at all costs. Yeah, I mean, sure, do that. Yeah, but then, yeah. I, then I question about universities, but I understand that the economic impact of that is huge. So, yeah, yeah. I think just slow everything down would be my, would be my um, argument. Um, Harika, can I just ask you, so, so the, the, your university's point seems really interesting to me. What would you do? Um, I don't know what I would do, but I think that universities maybe need to play some kind of role. Um, from what I've heard, they're obviously aware of the situation, especially with student halls and students moving back into areas where there's a lot of people that are really vulnerable. Um, but they're just staying silent, or at least I've not seen any kind of pledges or promises of how they're going to protect local communities. Um, and I think that relationship between universities and local residents is something that's really important. And it's already kind of put under tension when students come and litter or they're out late. So I think this is just a continuation of that and kind of the neglect that um, local residents are kind of left with when students come. And so, so, but, so that, but then what would be the sensible thing would be, because I see some people saying, let's go for local lockdowns. You could do some sectoral lockdowns. You could say, look, we're just going to try and limit the spread of this. So we will return kids to school, but we won't return universities. Is that balmy? Probably. Uh, I think you have to send them back to uni um, because then so many cities are so reliant on the students for um, economic reasons like we've seen and, and a lot of cities are kind of so much quieter without the students, for example, like Leeds. Um, to be honest, I don't, I don't know what the best thing to do is, but I just think there needs to be at least some dialogue or some kind of support or some kind of reassurance to local communities. I think the 10k um, fine for students, um, I get it's a lot of money, but I feel like that is what it's going to have to take to deter students from holding house parties. Um, and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, th there were just a couple of other people. J Giles, before we wind this up, what's your view on what's happened here with testing? Uh, just a proper screw up. Um, you may have seen what I put in the chat, purely anecdotal sample size of one. Young family, daughter needs to go back to school, symptoms, can't get tests, so whole family. Uh, basically back in prison at home. Uh, this is Devon. Key, key fact, um, six months to get this right, action, zero. Um, just on track and trace, some other, uh, this is just from quick read, uh, cafes and restaurants that are supposed to be taking uh, details are failing to take them. We must, uh, those of us who have ventured back in will probably have seen the sort of desultory the clipboards with a few scribbled names and obviously nothing's going to be done with them. In London, the standards reporting fewer than half of uh, those who have uh, put them, uh, identified them, themselves as close contacts of people who have a positive diagnosis have, have been reached by the system. Many of those who have themselves tested positive have not been reached to be asked about their close contacts. And, and then there's another category uh, uh, of those who have been reached and a quarter of them don't give any close contacts. So this country is not really cooperating, but, but the government isn't taking it seriously at all, it seems. And then and the, just one other thing, um, there's a track and trace and then separately uh, testing infrastructure. Hancock, we've had a problem with a couple of contracts, he admits. So that's yeah. the kind of thing that I would like to get to the bottom of, whether in ordinary reporting or a tortoise inquiry. What the heck? What problems? What contracts? You know, what excuse? What possible excuse now? When it was, it'd been obvious for months what that, you know, this is a you had one job type thing. And that was that was the, that was the case. All right. Charles, thank you. Tess, you put your hand back up. Did, we, did you want to come back in? Yeah, just just really quickly, James, the other thing that struck me this morning going through this sort of process is I didn't know who these guys were doing the tests. They're not. I don't know if they're regulated. I don't know. I mean, you well, know, I asked the them. Hmm? Oh, the, the, the yeah, the private, private test. 
And I asked them what their rate of false positives versus false negatives were on the tests. And they just went, oh, that's above my pay grade. And I suddenly thought, can I trust this test? I don't know. He's running it. Anyway, yeah. that was the other thing. Well, well I mean, I'm going to bring in, I was going to wind this up, but there are too many interesting things. Um, I want to say, Renee Blow, I said, uh, and thanks, Renee, for the hand, help on that. Renee, would you just come in? My colleague Kerry Thomas is there, and I just want to hear from Victoria San Vicente in a moment. So, Renee, first. Well, yeah, so you just wanted me to say why was it so easy to get a test yeah. in Glasgow? I mean, it was incredibly easy. Was you it? just You just went online. They told you where to go. You went there. You got the test. There was a huge number of people there um, to help everybody. And of the people who were there getting tested on that day, there must have been at least, I don't know, there was tens and tens of people there providing the service. Um, and it was set up by the military. And um, the number of people that were there getting tested at the time that my husband and I were there were two. There was me and him. And right. by the end of the day, we were sent, they, they said to us, you know, you'll get the result within three days. And we had the, a text message by the evening. So we were celebrating because we tested positive. I mean, negative. Right. Okay. Right. Sorry. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, Renee. Um, Kerry Thomas. It was just, um, I was just looking at figures, I was looking at figures last week for the number of tests in various European countries. So I, we might need to dig in a bit more to see whether there's a difference between voluntary tests and, and, and sort of tests that are being carried out routinely. Because if you look at the numbers, these were the figures on the 27th of August, um, the UK had done 16 and a quarter million tests, Germany just over 11 million, Italy 8 million, France 5 million. The UK is of EU or former EU countries by far has done the most tests. Um, Russia has done more, but it's, um, it's just not easy to square that with the conversation we've just had about how difficult it is to get a test like, um, like Tessa found. So what does that mean though? Does that mean that we keep testing the same people? That's, that's what I'm wondering, whether those are just routine tests of uh, health service staff, care home staff, whatever it might be, I don't know. Um, and I think a lot of scientists would say those tests might be more useful than self-prescribed tests, as it were, that people, people just deciding themselves to go for tests might not be as good a way or as useful a way to figure out the extent of the disease within the population as, as more targeted things. But, but certainly, you know, on, on the numbers, the UK track record is, is quite impressive, just, just on the raw, the raw number of, done, of tests being done. Okay. Um, Victoria, can I? It's, it's confusing, though, Kerry, isn't it? I mean, what is going on? Sorry, I should have kept quiet. No, 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 it's confusing. I don't understand what. Okay, well, let's. We've got to, we've got to look into that, too. Um, Victoria. Hi. Um, yeah, so uh, I don't know if uh, maybe uh, this ties in with the Extinction Rebellion. Uh, parts of the uh, of the thinking but basically my comment was um on thursday um i was on a critical mass that was related to extinction rebellion mm -hmm. and um it was blocked by the police on lambeth bridge and there were 200 people on the bridge obviously you know some of us weren't wearing masks because we were on bikes so obviously it was socially distanced until uh, the police blocked everyone on the bridge and kettled everyone and proceeded to start arresting everyone even though um, people wanted to leave and they weren't allowed to. And, um, and yeah, so I think it's very not only confusing the, uh, the messaging the government is, um, is putting out in general, but also the approach they have uh, towards enforcing certain rules on social distancing is really interesting because they're only using them when it's convenient. That's, that's really, I hadn't heard that about the kettling. That's really uh, uh, interesting and, and shocking. Victoria, listen, we're gonna, we're gonna switch now in a moment to, um, to the XR and the press question. And maybe we'll, we'll get a little bit further in, into that. Um, uh, I can see Nico McDonald, you've got your hand up. Nico, do you want to have the last word? And then I'm going to try and sort of thread together what we might say on this. Nico. 
Uh, yeah, just briefly, um, I don't think we've covered the issue of apps, so to speak, for yeah. uh, helping to determine if you've been in the presence of someone who's been uh, been infected. And I was traveling in Germany in the summer and found that the, the German Corona Warn app, which we are, were familiar with, which uses Apple and Google's technology, um, was incredibly well designed. I, I rarely read the end user license agreements or explanations for apps, as I'm sure is the case with most people. And I, I read the whole thing and probably took about 15 minutes to read, but they explained so clearly how the app worked, how the servers worked, how you get informed about uh, whether you're being close to someone infected. And I think it's a really a model for both app design and for app design in this area. Yeah. Uh, and I also noted in the chat the COVID symptom study that's been running since the start of lockdown, which is a voluntary thing, has about 4 million users, um, which does provide useful data, it seems. And my institution is using an app developed in Australia called Safe Zone, which does something similar to Corona Warn. So I think, although we shouldn't be over technocratic about this and over engineer these things, I think there's a lot of value in using these kind of services well uh, that needs to be, uh, we need to explore again, should we say. Well, let, let's, Nick, I, th I think you're right. I, let, me, let me put that in. What, what we're going to try and do, at least we're going to try this week and see whether it works, is use these conversations to inform the, the arguments we make. And as you can imagine, you're not going to come to a fully formed argument through just this discussion, you know, as Kerry's point about the scale of tests in the UK would suggest, some of these things need further investigation. But I suppose, for what it's worth, I think the way in which you would sensibly th uh, thread it would be something along these lines. One is to make the point that historically second waves, as, uh, as, as was pointed out in the chat, historically second waves have been um, uh, more deadly and more impactful than even the first. We are clearly at the beginning of uh, a, a resurgence. The infection numbers across Europe would suggest that. Um, and we have, as Basher pointed out, a, a big problem with what's known as long COVID, the number of people who've suffered long-term uh, uh, symptoms as a result. And there's a good deal about, you know, head and heart that we still don't know in terms of impacts. So I think having a, a heightened sensitivity to the health risks is a, is a good starting presumption. And there, there's got to be, as Matt pointed out, and I guess Merribee pointed out, uh, a willingness to recognize that the biggest mistake we made came in February and March, our failure to see what was happening in our European neighbors and, and to make the most of that timeline. So all of it would say we should be predisposed to locking down again to, to prevent health risks. And then I think the second, if you like, paragraph of that would be to argue the, the, the key levers that are at our disposal in terms of living with COVID, the argument that Michael and Katie and, uh, and others made and, and Liz made, are around, ironically for Dominic Cummings in this government, around data. Do we have good data on testing? Do we have good data on the enforcement of distancing? Do we have sufficient data on the information that we are getting from other countries about infection, hospitalizations, long-term illnesses and deaths? Uh, do we have good enough data on public understanding of uh, the rules, right? Do we have a good enough understanding on the efficacy of tests, false positives, right? The answer to all of these things is currently no, right? So that would again argue for a willingness to prepare for lockdown. I think we've set the economic preconditions that make it very hard, right? The suspension of furlough at the end of uh, October and a real failure to investigate some of the problems we've got, domestic violence and social. So I don't think we can underestimate those. So if you like, the third paragraph of that argument is the economic and social risks. But the fourth and concluding one in my mind would be to argue then to prepare the public, stop talking to the public like children, enough of don't give it to your gran, stop talking to the public like children, start talking to people in a sophisticated and adult way and say, there is a very high likelihood that we are gonna return certainly to national, local lockdowns and quite possibly to national ones. These are the things that are going to determine our thinking on that. And we may need to move 
quite swiftly, but at least then people can start preparing for that possibility. At the moment, it's being treated as a political problem rather than a practical one. And so I suppose that would be the argument that we would sort of pull together having having heard. We, we'll, we'll refine it and discuss it over the next coming days, but I, I, I hope that that's a good start. Um, this is, of course, turning out to be a proper news meeting in the sense that we've totally lost track of time uh, because the conversation's uh, too interesting. But I'm going, to, I'm going to ask, I think it's Zav and Ella, uh, I should give a full disclosure. When we talked yesterday about discussing XR and the disruption of the presses, I thought to myself, what's the point of discussing that? Everyone's going to say, look, of course, we've got to have freedom of speech, etc. But I've got to say, I check my own views on this. So who's who? Zav, are you in favour of the disruption of the uh, news presses? No. Oh, okay, well, let's get Ella. That's much more interesting. Okay, come on, Ella. Just unmuting. Okay. Um, so, obviously, most uh, papers, politicians um, have come out to say that XR was wrong to disrupt the presses and um, Boris Johnson said it's it's unacceptable. Lots of people said it's a threat to the free press and, and a threat to democracy. But sort of taking the, the counter position, I, I'm not entirely sure whether XR was making sort of a sustained attack on press freedom or whether the point was maybe a more nuanced one, which it's difficult perhaps to um, make through direct action like that. But um, it seems to me that the point of the protest was perhaps more that to say that, you know, the press is an influential pillar of our society and it could be doing and saying more about the urgency of climate change. You know, we as journalists and editors are the gatekeepers in, of information and we have a duty to report more um, on climate change. Um, we have the power to put pressure on governments and businesses to make change and, and maybe we aren't doing enough. And, you know, we as a newsroom, I'd say probably agree with the position that we need to do more and focus more on climate change. You know, our planet is a pillar of, um, you know, one of the five themes that drive, that drives us and our news and our reporting agenda um, as an organization. So if that's the point, then rather than, I think the means definitely do disrupt um, people's access to the news, obviously materially. Um, but perhaps the symbolism was meant to be slightly different. And, is it, and, and, and just the thing that intrigued me when I started thinking about it was, okay, what is the megaphone that, a, that an activist organization, a protest organization has back at the media, right? It's one thing to write to the editor, you know, it's another thing to say, we won't buy your papers. But the reality here is that XR has not disrupted the, the fundamental, uh, uh, exercise of free expression in any way, right? It, you, you can get all the information that the Times, the Telegraph, the Mail were publishing online. There, there's, there's, no, there's no silencing of any voices here. There's just a, an economic disruption of their business model. So, 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 so how have they got themselves into such a mess, do you think, Ella, that they're being seen as people, you know, silencing, dissenting voices, you know, preventing people from having access to information? Um, I think that probably, you know, the, the way that they've gone about this might not win them very many supporters. Um, and that could potentially be a, a problem for them. But I, I don't know if, if, if the point of, of XR is really about, you know, it's not a popularity contest for them. It's not about necessarily being liked. It's more about getting their message out there. And, and if that's the point of it, then they've definitely done that. You know, they're, they are in every newspaper now. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's, let, me, let, me hear from, let me hear from Zav, that old establishment sort of stalwart. Zav, so your argument, what, what's your argument that they're doing the wrong thing? So my argument's a bit of a different one. So I, I think that um, I agree with the principle of direct action and I have a lot of sympathy for XR. I think, as you know, we 
uh, me and my colleague Tom, we covered them quite a lot last year. I, I think where, where I, um, where I think this is a bad action is kind of on a tactical level. I mean, I mean, Ella said, um, you know, XR are not engaging in a popularity contest, but quite, quite embedded in XR's, um, you know, tactics and movements is this, this idea of the kind of 3.5% rule, which this, what, what's uh, that? What's uh, that? The sociologist called Erica Chenoweth, who studied uh, violent and non-violent protest movements in the last century. And basically the idea behind the rule is in a non-violent movement, once you get 3.5% of the country directly on your side, then you can, you know, enact some huge change. So on, 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 so on the starting point, I do think that they do want to, they want some basic level of popularity for what they're doing. Um, and I think, or, although morally you might be able to justify the direct action, on a governmental level, it was a bad action because it didn't focus on any particular policy. It didn't challenge the government on anything in particular. What it did was give the government an easy win in their kind of ruling the country by culture war, um, you know, uh, method to say, hey, look at these people, aren't they, aren't they stupid? Um, you know, stick up for the free press. I think on a newspaper level, it was a bad action because it may have affected the revenues on a kind of one-off basis. But newspapers, you know, remove their paywalls. I'm sure lots of traffic was driven to their websites anyway. Um, and I think on a public level, it was a bad action because I think I think XR did this with the tube trains as well. I think they they take you know actions which are going to get a lot of attention. They um, then when they go wrong, say no, but the symbolism of it was a point, and they ex accept people to just they expect people to accept that. And ultimately, if, if you're having to kind of explain the symbolism of all the actions you're taking, instead of doing a kind of focused action where people can clearly see this is what you're protesting about, then and you're failing as a movement. Because, you know, it might be popular for lots of people on Twitter who think deeply about these things or, or whatever. It's not going to be popular for, you know, the person who reads the Times and can't, can't get their newspaper. Um, and, and interestingly as well, I think both this action and the tube action last time round, I think were both actions which were taken when XR was feeling a bit desperate about the fact that they hadn't got enough attention that they needed. I think April last year was their kind of peak where they were getting lots of attention and it was a swelling movement. And the last two protests, I think actually people's attention has been elsewhere um, and uh, and, and, you know, to, to make a bigger point, I do think XR have kind of missed their opportunity now. I think they've done a, done a good job over the past year and a half, but I don't think they're going to get the numbers or have sufficient popular support to sway the government on anything. So, so, I think they're almost in the way. They're almost in the way? God, that's an interesting thing to say. But K Katie, um, I, I'm, Victoria, I'm going to come back to you because I can see your hand up, but my colleague Katie Vanek-Smith, Hello. Both of both of us worked the times for a fair old while. So, what do you what did you what do you feel? Um, so, they've not been on the agenda for a very long time. To Zav's point, mm. and you could argue whether it's a a, a, a a clever PR stunt or a sort of naive or sort of slightly useless PR stunt, but it, it's got them back on the front pages. Mm. So, I think you know there is an element of we all know that climate has dropped off the agenda for many people because mm. health and personal health and COVID has been driven most of the conversations. So on one level, it was a successful PR moment for them because it has put, you know, that conversation back in. But to Zab's point, I think it's been done poorly mm. because it has done it about the, the tactics rather than actually the issues. Mm. So, um, and just as, just interestingly, there was absolutely minimal disruption from a News Corp uh, person high up. Um, everything got out with the exception of the Telegraph. So they didn't really actually cause much um, disruption at all. The paper and, was all there. And, and the interesting thing is, of course, the Telegraph is now printed on the News Corp, the Murdoch Presses, which is a, yeah. of itself kind of interesting. V Victoria San Vicente, you wanted to come back in. I see Jeff Meenan's got their hand up too. Yeah. Um, I mean, full disclosure, I obviously I feel strongly about um, the climate 
hence why I was on the critical mass on Thursday. And from my personal perspective, I thought it was absurd that the police could just kettle people, 200 people, arrest most of them um, under no clear grounds. Most of those arrests were unlawful. And the day after on the press, I couldn't see anything about it. And uh, I only saw on the BBC a comment uh, to the effect that uh, 200 arrests were made in connection with the protests on Lambeth Bridge. Mm -hmm. But there was no clear explanation of what happened. And then all of a sudden, this, um, this thing happened where <laughs> this group of people decided to disrupt um, the, the press. Mm. And um, I still haven't formed an opinion on the actual action, mm. but I do find it interesting that uh, it's only then that it became a conversation. The protest started a week ago. Uh, it's all around uh, the passing of the Climate and Ecological Emergency Bill. And um, I think the fact that at least now it's being talked about is a success. Yeah. I, do you think it, it might have been an own goal? Because obviously, if it is true that the press is being monopolized, then if you make an enemy of the people monopolizing it, maybe it's not the best move. Well, uh, I, Victoria, Victoria th thank you. It, it, it's really interesting what gets covered and what doesn't. One of the reasons we found a tortoise was, was to try and address that. I'm gonna just let Jeff Meenan have one final word and then, uh, and then round things up. But Victoria, thank you very much. Thank you very much, James. Thank you. I was just basically going to say that um, it, it is very interesting that the whole uh, the whole debate has, has resolved around uh, XOR and what's happened there. Whereas last week in Dover, uh, we saw a similarly uh, disruptive gang uh, trying to disrupt um, matters there. And we haven't had any kind of debate at all about uh, criminalizing them. And it, it seems to be more and more, I think we saw with the Black Lives Matter um, uh, protests, that what we've seen is, um, you know, not so much um, emphasis has been on criminalizing the right wing elements. Yeah. And I wonder if that's uh, just an indication of where we are mm -hmm. uh, in the mainstream politically at the moment. Yeah. It, 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 it's very interesting. There's the, the, the politics of law and order and, uh, and um, and disruptive direct action are, are very interesting and you're right to, to raise them. I see that, uh, I see Jeff and everyone else, I see that actually we've hit the end of the hour. Um, I'm saying two brief things. One is, um, for what it's worth, I found myself much more sympathetic to XR and the arguments that Ella was making than I'm, I would guess I'd be, given that I've been a newspaper person my whole life. Partly because it seems to me as though part of the extinction rebellion argument is with the complacency of the establishment in the face of the climate emergency and if you are going to be uh, radical activists you are going to take on that establishment you take it on in politics in business and inevitably in the media too and it does seem to me that there is a dis difference between disrupting the business model of newspapers and suffocating free expression and the one they were seeking to do and the other they weren't. And it's no surprise, of course, that the newspapers have then uh, reinterpreted that as an assault on freedom of expression. In the end, I don't think that that was under uh, attack. What was under attack was the position of those papers in particular. And that challenge is a challenge that has to be answered. Um, the second thing I'd say is that um, not for the first time, we've bitten off more than we can chew. Um, one of the biggest issues facing this country, whether we will or won't get a deal, even a slim one on Brexit, has not been answered in the hour we've had. And we haven't, forgive me, got into state aid, what it means, how it works, and whether it's worth the fight. Uh, 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 apologies for those people who wanted to come in and weigh in on this. Um, we're going to keep refining this open news meeting. This has felt certainly uh, like an engaging conversation and hope that people have found it worthwhile. Um, I'm going to end, though, by doing one thing that I was really supposed to do at the beginning. We have a poll, uh, a polling function, where you can vote whether you do or don't think we should lock down. And Sam, if as a final turn, you'll put that poll up and invite people to to click on it, I'd be interested to know just at the end what they think. So you should be able to go to your screen and click yes, no, or unsure. 
and then submit it. And the final answers. Sam, are you going to? This is seamless, of course. You're going to share the answer. 18% yes, 19% no, 33% unsure. Sorry, eight, sorry, 18% yes, 49% no, 33% unsure. Okay, 49% no, got it. Um, thank you very much, everyone. We're going to keep on refining this. Uh, do join us. By the way, tomorrow evening, if you're free, come and join us at 6.30. Rupert Bregman is going to be talking about humankind. People are good. And finally, for me and Liz, who've debated this backwards and forwards, give, make some sense, I hope, of universal basic income. Do join us tomorrow at 6.30. Have a good afternoon, everyone.